Hello, it's lovely to see you here and it's an absolute delight and an honour to be invited to um, give the opening keynote here. My name's Professor Emma Rees, I'm Professor of Literature and Gender Studies at the University of Chester. Um, you've got my email address here um, and uh, as uh, Bridget Daniel was saying, um, my uh, social media, my Twitter account as well if you want to do tweets. Um, you're not undergrads and therefore if you're using your phones during my talk I shan't give you a stern look, I shall assume that you're merely tweeting rather than arranging what you're going to have for tea or something like that. Um, I do want to thank Monica for her remarkable energy and vision in bringing all of us together here today. It's quite remarkable that she's been able to do that. Um, and also Queen Margaret University, a trailblazing institution in terms of the education of women since the late 19th century. I also want to thank the caters, the cleaners and the admin workers and the maintenance people who are the invisible workforce that make sure that these rooms and these facilities are up and running and ready for us to be able to speak about our ideas. Today I want to talk about feminism. I want to talk about who broke it and hopefully uh, talk a little bit about how we might mend it. I want to start with a short quotation Yeah, that's what I did. We'll see. Right, not firm enough, sorry, it's a little early yet. Um, from uh, one of my heroes, the uh, feminist activist, academic Audre Lorde, who of course died in 1992. And it comes from a really short essay that she wrote in 1983, uh, and one of the most famous quotations that I'm sure many of you will have come across already is this one, that the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. I wanted to start with this quotation because for me it encapsulates some of the curious contradictions and continuities that structure how we understand the idea of feminism today. The important thing about Lord is that she was emphasising diversity. She was particularly critiquing white academic feminism and as a white academic feminist I am acutely aware of the numerous privileges that are packed into that term and I'm going to start to unpick some of those privileges as my talk progresses. She was urging feminists here to dismantle the very structures and that idea of structure is so fundamental to me that I want to think a little bit more about it as well, that underpin patriarchy while acknowledging that in fact because of where and how we live, those very structures are all we have to work with and within. It's a contradictory position. She was, in short, identifying that feminism is somehow broken. She was urging us to consider that our personal lives have uh, political ramifications. This continuum between the personal and the political. And importantly, something we do well to remember always is that if we thrive, often that's because somebody else is suffering. And there are examples of that from the cheap t-shirts that I can buy on the high street to bigger issues within the military industrial complex. She says, what does it mean when the tools of a racist patriarchy are used to examine the fruits of that same patriarchy. It means that only the most narrow parameters of change are possible and allowable. But far from this being a statement of resignation or inaction, I read Audrey Lord here as saying something about the importance of inciting uncomfortable analysis difficult analysis, challenging us to look for new tools, new models of support and solidarity. Lord's message that sexism, racism, homophobia and other forms of oppression need to be challenged even at great personal cost has to be heeded. The master's tools that she talks about are categories that construct the 
other women included as dangerous. Those categories of sexism, homophobia, racism, ableism, classism. And I also think that we can expand this idea of the master's tool to include institutions that perpetuate precisely those categories. So, who broke feminism? There was going to be an actual one million dollar reward if we could get to the answer by the end of today but i left it on the train so i'm sorry about that there is no one million dollar reward who are our likely culprits well on the one hand a kind of obvious and fairly easy answer is men but obviously that's deeply problematic the role of men in feminism is a crucial and important one, and one that we cannot deny. What we also can't deny, of course, are those statistics that suggest that the kind of acts of violence against women that are carried out by men. A slightly more surprising one, perhaps, is that sometimes women are enemies of feminism. And have broken femini feminism by moving it away from being a sort of coherent, consolidated political movement into becoming something quite other, quite different. And I'm going to do some quite um, intense analysis during this talk about those women who I think set out to do precisely that. It could be the media, a huge term, of course. Um, there's a kind of wallpaper of misogyny that we all get very used to living with. Sometimes it's literal, sometimes it's about going down into the tube station in London and seeing these images uh, being shared that tell us something about how women ought to look, behave, or what they ought to purchase. But it's also a far more insidious kind of wallpaper. It's the messages that we're given repeatedly through our interactions with other institutions and people. Patriarchy. Is patriarchy what's broken feminism? To some extent, of course. But then the flip side of that, and this is about the master's tools and the master's house again, patriarchy exists. Feminism exists because patriarchy exists. So there's a curious kind of symbiosis between those. And patriarchy can be a pretty sort of nebulous term anyway, and one that I want to unpick a bit. Because at the fundamental um, base of patriarchy is the curse of neoliberalism that's creeping into um, life, particularly in the global north, and having therefore ramifications and implications for um, the South and for developing countries that we need to keep an eye on. And then capitalism. And as, again, I think it was Bridget who said, but it may have been one of her colleagues, um, if we could um, effect the overthrow of capitalism by 5 p.m. today, that would be great. If it takes until 6, I'm sure we can get some coffee to keep us going. But if we can make that our aim, that would be lovely. So these are the culprits. These are potentially the elements that are breaking feminism and stopping it being that vital, coherent feminist movement. The media, and again, as I said, that's a very wishy-washy term, but we kind of all know what that means, has a degree of responsibility in this. And it's very happy particularly the print media, to tell us how broken feminism is. Because the more you tell a political movement that it's broken and dysfunctional, the less easy it is to make it coherent and functional. So here are some examples of how we're fed information about what feminism is. This was good news. For those of us who are wondering, The Spectator has reassured us that feminism is over because the battle is won and therefore thank you for coming along this morning and listening to my talk. No, I don't, I'm not sure I totally agree with them. It could be, this was also good news I thought, fabulous, the patriarchy is dead, 
feminists accepted, says this female identified author. So again, great news. I hadn't noticed it personally, but if it's in the media, it must be true. And then one of my favorite people in all the world, I just lied to you, that was fake, fake news that I just put out there. Kellyanne Conway, um, her, her fairly recent comments, this was back in the spring. Um, we need to remember who Kellyanne Conway's employer is and how he grabs the attention of women. Um, uh, Professor Hayden uh, is going to be talking about those sorts of issues later today. Um, sexism is not just personal behaviour, it's another institutional emblem of privilege and of power. So, what's really going on behind these headlines? Neoliberalism depends on two key things. The first is that those of us with privilege don't see or acknowledge that privilege. It's just taken as read. It doesn't need unpicking, critiquing. We're just comfy and it's all lovely. Thank you. The second thing underpinning neoliberalism is that those who have that privilege are always going to be reluctant to give it up. To some extent, it's going to have to be taken from them because if you are comfortable and happy and sorted, parentheses and have no conscience, then why would you want a change in the status quo? So what happens is that often feminism is sold to us as what's called feminism light or choice feminism. Choice feminism is a term that particularly interests me because the idea of choice is fundamental to so much feminist discourse, but actually we need to think about the ramifications of the choices that each of us make. While we're worrying about what we're being told feminism means, we're not focusing on the bigger structural problems of capitalism, the patriarchy and neoliberalism. And while our attention's diverted, of course, we're effectively politically impotent. So here are some examples of what that means. Things that we need to worry about as feminists. Okay, so the pressing question. Forget about the 200 million women alive today with the effects of female genital mutilation. Forget about them, because what matters is this right here, okay? Can I feminist wear high heels? I noticed Monica's shoes, which are frankly superb, and realized she's not a feminist. This is outrageous. <laughs> Here's one, and as I was putting my lipstick on this morning, I thought I've let the side down again. My political activism is now meaningless because this is what feminism's really about. This one I quite liked. <laughs> the older I get, the less I can tolerate hen parties. Um, I don't know about you, but at the most recent one I went to, which mercifully is about 15 years ago, there were plastic straws, drinking straws, I'm just going to say in novelty shapes and I'm going to leave that there <laughs> because I suddenly realised that this was not my kind of thing. Um, quite strange. Emma Watson, marvellous UN ambassador, feminist, the He For She campaign, all that sort of stuff. Um, strong, outspoken, but um, how dare she also be sexual? under her own conditions? How dare she also wear revealing outfits? The press wants us to believe that somehow that's incompatible with feminism. And the final image here, I didn't even get the memo <laughs> that told me that this was what I ought to be worried about. So again, my own inadequacy, I have a list of utter feminist inadequacies. I'm gonna have to put this one on the list because I wasn't worried enough about it, clearly. But this is what the media is telling me. Feminism light, choice feminism, 
these sorts of issues, this is not feminism. This is not feminism as coherent political movement. This is a tinkering at the edges. This is a kind of playfulness, a kind of other way to make women feel inadequate or not able to express themselves and their appearance and so on. And while this is going on, it suits the power structures just fine. They can sit back personifying power structures here, and I haven't really thought this one through, but they can sit back in a street cafe with a fat cigar, what would Freud say? I don't know, but anyway, um, and say, yeah, you just get on with your, your little feminist debates, because we're not thinking about the structural changes. And women continue to be marginalized, pushed to the peripheries, written out of history. In just the last week or so, I wanted to see how feminism in the news was talked about. So I just uh, looked at a few more images. This was a story about a rather wonderful statue called Fearless Girl in Wall Street. It may be one that you're familiar with. There's the big bull of Wall Street. And then opposite her, an artist has put this fantastic bronze of a little girl with her hands on her hips. Now, this was uh, paid for by an organization called State Street Global Advisors. They put the money up for the Fearless Girl statue. And Vanity Fair have recently been among several publications that have uh, discovered that actually State Street Global Advisors are paying women and black executives um, less than they're paying men and white executives in their company. Uh, another example, this is uh, a Mexican, have we got anybody who's traveled from Mexico today? Oh, I really wanted to ask about this. This was remarkable. Um, and again, Monica, you're doing something wrong because you've got women talking about feminism and this, this simply won't do. Um, a, a very prestigious Mexican university decided they needed to talk about feminism. So they set up a panel to talk about feminism. It was a panel of 11 and every single one of the 11 was or identified as a man. Something slightly strange going on there, something quite problematic. More seriously, every single day in Mexico, seven women are murdered, every single day. But as long as we've got 11 guys talking about feminism, that should be sorted fairly soon. And finally this week, of course, you'll have heard about this man. Um, Harvey Weinstein um, being vocal in his support for various marches, protests. He's a media mogul um, and uh, recently, as in the last 48 hours or so, um, has had to face numerous allegations of sexual impropriety with women. So he's wearing his, his pussy hat metaphorically and saying, I'm all in support of women. But when it comes to the structures of the organization and to his personal behavior, he's not really doing that at all. If we're not really careful then, feminism has been broken to the point where it's equated with empty gestures and big fundamental structural issues aren't addressed at all structural issues that are costing women their lives globally. Where does the real power lie then? If feminism is over, and remember we're being told that it is, then presumably power is sorted. Well, no, <coughs> because remember we're always having to follow the money metaphorically, look at where the structural inequalities are. Every year, the G8 and the G20 and the financial ministers uh, get together and they decide what's best for us. What's best for us is actually what's best for neoliberalism. And every year, rather like mortified school children, they have um, a photo call. These photo calls are fantastic. So for the past 20 or 30 years, this is what the photo calls have looked like. I don't know if you sense a pattern emerging. <laughs> now sometimes they will allow a woman to take her place at the table. But the fact that we can name those women, projecting, that I can name those women 
far more easily than most of the men in most of the roll calls from the past 20 or 30 years, says something about that, that adage about the exception proving the rule. So they will allow in Margaret Thatcher, for example. That was fine in the 1980s. She was um, anti-feminist, liberalist, uh, pr an, a neoliberal, um, capitalist, an enemy to women. She did a lot of damage to women in this country. Angela Merkel, for example. And then if they're talking about money, um, Christiana Lagarde every now and then will be allowed to make an appearance. But look at the homogeneity of these images. Look at what power actually looks like structurally, globally. These are the people that are making the laws, the decisions. They're deciding how the money should be distributed. They're deciding major policies that affect not only the global north, but developing nations as well. This is what power looks like. So I knew he'd hate that picture, so I thought, yeah, let's just use that picture. So what are we going to do about it? How do we answer these big structural issues of power? As I've already suggested, we need to start thinking about our own privilege. There's a rather wonderful scholar called Peggy McIntosh. She's a bit of a hero of mine. And in the 1980s, she talked about white privilege. And what's interesting about white privilege is that it also works in terms of gendered privilege too. She said, I see white privilege as a bank account that I did not ask for, but I can choose to spend. A bank account that I did not ask for, but I can choose to spend. And I think that in many ways, Peggy, Peggy Mashintosh is one of the first people to really to think about those intersections. A lot of you are familiar with the idea of intersectionality. So uh, gender, race, ethnicity are all imbricated in fundamental ways. What she said was that thinking through unacknowledged male privilege, because if you have privilege, she's saying, sometimes you don't even notice it, you just go with it. I'm all right, feminism sorted. Thinking through unacknowledged male privilege, she said as a phenomenon, I have come to see white privilege as an invisible package of unearned assets that I can count on cash cashing in each day, but about which I was meant to remain oblivious. And she has this image whereby white privilege is like an invisible weightless knapsack of special provisions. I always think of Dora the Explorer here. Um, maps, passports, code books, visas, clothes, tools, and blank checks. Don't shout at me, but she can't spell check properly because she's using American English. Judy, my American colleague, um, so I corrected that. And what's really revealing here as well is how easily this applies, bless you, to gendered privilege as well as to white privilege. So a white man, his knapsack is full of so much metaphorical stuff. He doesn't even really realize it's there, but he can use it. He has a different kind of freedom of movement, of expression. He has different access to finances, uh, to the globe. So we really need to think about women globally. We need to have all sorts of perspectives. We need to take that knapsack off, go through it and say, oh, yes, that's my privilege. I take that for granted. But actually, woman X in developing country Y doesn't have that in her knapsack. She doesn't have the same thing. So, intersectionality and privilege. If we reject feminism as being something about feminism light and look instead at the structures that disempower women, if we agitate for equality, then we're likely to get called out by a troll on Twitter or by a friend sometimes or in print. All three have happened to me. And for me, the question of, well, why are we talking about women's rights? What about, what about the men? Almost a hashtag on its own. Um, then we need to look at, again, another rather wonderful writer, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. Um, if you haven't read her little pamphlet yet, and I'm sure many of you have, then do. Uh, we, all should be, we should all be feminists, it's called. She's super. She says... Some people ask why the word feminist 
why not just say you're a believer in human rights or something like that? Because that would be dishonest. Feminism is, of course, part of human rights in general, but to choose to use the vague expression human rights is to deny the specific and particular problem of gender. It would be a way of pretending that it was not women who have for centuries been excluded. It would be a way of denying that the problem of gender targets women, that the problem wasn't about being human, but specifically about being a female human. This is a great riposte when people, and they will, and they do, say yes, but what about the men? There is something in what she's saying here. She's an inspirational philosopher, and now something quite different. In 2013, a group of women got together on Tumblr, which my students rely me is, uh, reliably inform me is a thing, and on this, the Tumblr, uh, told me um, about Women Against Feminism, which now has around 45,000 followers. Um, it's a Facebook group as well, and the group defines itself as women's voices against modern feminism and its toxic culture. Remember, the toxic culture is feminism itself. What really strikes me about women against feminism is how painfully they're missing the point. The irony is that for women like the women who sign up to Women Against Feminism, to be able to articulate in a public space how they're all right and how feminism doesn't have any purpose anymore is as the result of feminist activism. That's what's brought them to this point to be able to say we don't need feminism anymore. It's a privilege and they don't see that privilege. The sort of shtick of women and feminism is that you write down why you're not a feminist. You can see some of them in the background. You hold it up, you take a picture using your, your webcam or a selfie or whatever, and then you publish this on their platform so people can know why you're not a feminist. Here are four of the reasons um, that were given. One of them says on her piece of paper that she holds up that she doesn't need feminism because there's no patriarchy. Again, that's fab, I'm really pleased about that. <laughs> but I have my doubts. Another one tells us that she doesn't need feminism because she's not oppressed. Little round of applause for this particular <laughs> not oppressed woman. Another tells us that she understands that equality doesn't mean uniformity and I appreciate the differences between men and women. That for me is a little bit feminist light. There's something fundamental and important about what she's saying there, but some of those differences between men and women, especially women who don't live in the global north, are literally a matter of life and death. Seven women every day are murdered in Mexico. And finally, I don't need feminism because uh, I love men. All of my friends are men. All of her friends are men because no woman can bear to be around her. <laughs> is, is my theory. Small sample size, admittedly, but you know. So what I thought I'd do would be to choose one of these women who goes onto this public platform, and it is a public platform, um, and I've chosen her in the, just because she was in the middle. And I want to kind of dissect, um, deconstruct what on earth is going on here. There are four categories that I think this woman's image um, speaks to particularly. And these uh, four categories suggest how very little thought she's given to those bigger structural fundamental issues around feminism. The first is her appearance. Now obviously from this I can't tell anything about her ethnicity or race. I can only guess what the insignia, the emblems, the appearance of her appearance, if you like, uh, what the information there is giving me. And I would venture that this is a, a white woman. Of course she may not identify like that, but the insignia suggests white woman to me. The second is that 
Think about the process that goes behind this picture. She's gone to a stationery shop, probably on her own, maybe driven herself there with her own money to choose some stationery, to choose a pen. Once she's done that, she's been able to actually, frankly, punctuate very well. Um, she's written coherently, she's made a statement um, and is clearly therefore um, literate. She has the resources and the literacy to be able to hold up the sign to say why she doesn't need feminism. The third of these, of course, is what has she written? The takeaway message. Do I look oppressed? No, you don't, love. Frankly, you don't look oppressed. And again, let's have a little round of applause for this woman who does not look oppressed. And the naivety of assuming that oppression is also, again, visible um, is, is quite telling. Finally, the whole image, she has a platform that she feels safe in occupying. <coughs> so this is a public site. She can take a clear photograph. Once she's happy with that photograph, she can upload it to the internet. So presumably there's electricity that's reliable. She has internet resources. She has no fear of showing her identity in this space. And somehow, somewhere along the line, she's assuming that this is true for all women and therefore feminism is an anachronism. Let's look at each of those four categories in a little bit more detail. The first is this insignia of racial identity. A recent report by this rather wonderful organisation, Women's Aid, says, quote, there is no evidence to suggest that women from some ethnic or cultural communities are at any more risk than others. However, women from black, Asian or minority ethnic communities are likely to face additional barriers to receiving the help that they need. Their experiences, the report concludes, may be compounded by racism, which is pervasive in the UK. The second of those, remember, was about literacy and resources. This is a little map that shows us the female literacy rate in Nigeria. And you can see that around 50% of women in Nigeria currently um, aren't literate. They don't have access to or skills of literacy. The global literacy challenge is gendered. For the past two decades, women have accounted for approximately two thirds of all illiterate adults. And the gender gap they carry on is nearly as wide among young people. Women's illiteracy remains stubbornly high at 477 million, 477 million illiterate women. And that's fallen by 1% since the year 2000. In South and West Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, the report tells us, the UNESCO report, South and West Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, half the adult women cannot read or write. Okay. What's her takeaway message then? Do I look oppressed? Need I say more than a little bit of, yeah, there's a lot of I and very little collective we in what she's saying. She also, of course, as I said, needed to be able to take a clear photo to put her message out there with the 45,000 other women who've done the same on that Facebook group. And that relies on reliable e electricity and um, internet access. And this foundation tells us um, a year ago that there's a long path to digital equality that lies ahead. A majority of over the over 4 billion people still offline today are women. So there are 4 billion people who don't have internet access. And I know that some of us think that the hierarchy of needs should be rewritten with Wi-Fi uh, at the bottom, but actually this is a serious issue. And the majority of those 4 billion people are women. In short, what women in feminism as a group is worried about is um, deck chairs. There's the old idiom analogy of the Titanic. And if somebody is rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic, thinking, 
not quite sure about the placement of that deck chair, moving it a little bit, they're taking their eye off the bigger picture um, and uh, they're not seeing what that issue really is. Why don't they see what that issue is? Why do they worry about the deck chairs on the deck of the Titanic rather than the iceberg which is there and is about to spell doom? It's because they have the privilege not to have to concern themselves with the iceberg. They can fret about the deck chairs. They don't even have to ask why, for example, this rather remarkable woman has taken so long to gain recognition. This is Ada Lovelace and today is Ada Lovelace Day. And if you haven't heard of her, then that's absolutely fine because in a sense, so much of how history has um, been created means that we haven't heard of her. She worked in uh, the 19th century with um, Charles Babbage. Now you'll almost certainly have heard of Charles Babbage, particularly again, if you're from the global north, he invented the first computer. He could not have done it without Ada Lovelace. She's a computer programmer and you may not have heard of her. Women get eradicated from history. She was um, the poet Byron's daughter. She was an extraordinary woman. Um, and Ada Lovelace Day happens every, day, every year in this country, 10th of October this year, to celebrate women in STEM. Um, so science, technology, engineering and mathematics who still find it hard to be um, taken seriously or to access those professions. Perhaps if we taught children in the UK as much about Ada Lovelace and her contribution as we do about Charles Babbage and his, more young girls might think I could do that too. So what are we going to do about it? We have to recognise the continuum. There was um, the rather wonderful Carol Hanisch, um, who was a New York feminist activist. She was a member of a group called the Red Stockings, uh, who famously disrupted um, the Miss America pageants in the 60s and the 70s. And she wrote um, a very famous essay in 1969, although she may actually, she now says, not have made up the title herself. We need to educate women and girls, boys and men, we need to stop thinking that globalisation, the um, wonderful uh, aspect of neoliberalism, is a good thing and think more about global thinking. Globalisation is phenomenally damaging. And we need to see this continuum that Hanish told us about, where she informs us that personal problems are political problems. There are no personal solutions at this time. There's only collective action for a collective solution collective action for a collective solution. What does that mean in practice? The Women's March in uh, January was really quite remarkable as an example of when we have collective action. There were almost 700 marches worldwide uh, more than 5 million participants on all seven continents people in Antarctica. I think they were people, not penguins, I need to check my sources, but people in Antarctica joined in with the Women's March. The Women's March, again, is again not, a, not without uh, controversy and perhaps an element of privilege. The issue around the pussy hats, the idea about how you can be a woman without a vag vagina, but you can, be a, you can have a vagina and not identify as a woman, those issues for some people weren't dealt with adequately enough. Here are some more examples of that kind of collective action. My own favourite one is this one. <laughs> All the progress that we think we're making. Um, and actually, here we are in the 21st century, we should be celebrating how far we've come. We really haven't come terribly far at all. Um, the last suggests, again, those structural issues that I keep mentioning. Um, the structural issues aren't changing. Think about those nine um, pictures of where the power really resides and how many of those were evidently people who identified as men. Women are not making those decisions. And credit to Monica and her colleagues, of course, this is part of a collective um, action for a collective solution. The fact that we're in this room for the next two days talking about and exposing these issues and trying to find answers too. 
so to finish off with, I want to um, read you a little bit from my third book. It's been through many working titles because I'll either clean my fridge or think of a new title for my book when I'm meant to be working on it. If you want uh, a writer with a clean fridge, or you meet a writer with a clean fridge, you know they have a deadline. It's a scientific fact. The current working title is That is a Feminist Issue. Some of you may see what I've done there. Um, my second uh, book was one that kind of got me thinking about some of these broader issues. And it was a literary and cultural history of representations of the vagina. Um, and uh, it's taken me all over the world to talk about issues that people previously weren't talking about. Um, uh, this isn't a, an advert, it's just so I don't forget, but um, Bloomsbury have given me some copies to sell out remarkably cheaply, so if you're interested in that, let me know. So, I'm going to read to you for the last 10 minutes from That is a Feminist Issue. Structurally, it's tripartite, so I have personal anecdotes for each chapter about how I came to realise that I was a feminist in terms of the particular issue I'm addressing in that chapter. Then it looks at the broader issues of that chapter and then it has a global engagement because again, I'm fed up of academics only talking to other academics and I'm fed up of white feminists only talking about white feminism. We've got to start broadening our vision. So I'm going to read to you. Collectivity, education and consciousness raising won't solve those social, structural and cultural inequalities, but they will equip us to ask of capitalist patriarchy the question it fears above all others. Why? Think about it. Why? Questions an awful lot of assumptions, and the neoliberal status quo depends on the apathy that unquestioned assumptions breed. Why is there an obesity crisis and widespread famine on the same little planet? Why do some women who don't want to partic participate in pornography still do so? Why in some sectors of the media are famous women not praised for their achievements but rather are derided for being too fat, too thin, too frumpy, too old? Why isn't there a contraceptive pill for men? Why do some men hurt women? Why does someone keep recommissioning keeping up with the Kardashians? <laughs> Why in the UK do 9 out of 10 heterosexual women in relationships do more housework than their partners? Why is breastfeeding in public seen by some as dirty? Why is my womb subject to your legislation? Why are you willing to spend £490, £490 on a feminist t-shirt from Dior without demanding to know how much money the woman who made it is actually getting to take home with her? Collectively, we need to be adult versions of that irritating kid in the supermarket. You know the one, she asks why, and having been answered or fobs off, asks why again and again. Good girls don't ask why. Let's not be good girls anymore. Logically, if oppression and sexism exist in our individual personal lives, there's no earthly reason why they won't exist in our collective political ones too. But isn't it exhausting to be our own CCTV cameras, to engage in self-surveillance 24-7? Why can't our personal lives be just that, full of guilty pleasures, sexual fantasies and ethical contradictions? Our personal lives are actually far less personal than we like, like to think, and that's why what we wear, read, eat, watch, buy, drive, drink, clean, are all under scrutiny. Domestic life can be just as oppressive as public life, regardless of who we share it with. This means that injustices are endured and vital structural political changes remain unrealised. If we're not careful, we relax under a kind of oppression that's sold to us as benign until we're completely ensconced in a comfy world of Netflix and lycra and lattes.
And we get stuck there because, let's face it, it's not a bad way to pass the time. We float quite merrily in a miasma of quilted loo paper and bottled water and plug-in air fresheners that say hazardous to wildlife and capsule coffee machines with plastic capsules that aren't recyclable and scented panty liners and scatter cushions. When this happens, we lose sight of other women and of the world and of our authentic, authentic selves. I'm absolutely not saying that we should march on Joe Malone with pitchforks demanding to see the manager to get a refund for all the scented candles we suddenly feel we've been duped into buying down the years. But there is one called Green Tomato Leaf and that's foul and I would like a refund for that one. So if anybody, yeah. I am saying that we should open our eyes, act like the responsible adults we are, be aware again of how choices sometimes aren't choices at all. Capitalism and neoliberalism undoubtedly top feminism's most wanted list. They're the biggest culprits when it comes to fostering in us a sense of false consciousness. Now, sociologists, as many of you know, call housework and childcare the second shift. More women than men put in a second shift. Additionally, many women from the poorest socioeconomic backgrounds put in a second second shift as carers, nannies or cleaners for the women doing the first second shift. Naomi Wolf wrote a brilliant book in the early 90s called The Beauty Myth in which she pointed out that many women also work a third shift. That's a shift of plucking and shaving and bleaching and polishing and relaxing and straightening and curling and contouring and dyeing and dieting and starving and purging and blending and moisturising and cleansing and toning, exfoliating, plumping, filling, abrading, containing and perfuming. So if you're a woman, chances are that you're working three or four shifts. And the possibility is, given that in the UK alone, over 27% of all women will experience domestic violence at some point in their lives, that you're being physically, sexually or emotionally abused in between times. If this is life for so many women, then feminism's job is in no way over. Everywhere, women are still conforming to and being judged on impossibly, unrealistically, pointlessly high standards at home and at work and in and on their bodies. Because those standards are impossibly, <coughs> unrealistically, pointlessly high, women by definition fail. Appalling things are done to women in their personal lives and in their public lives whether they live in Hoxton, or Damascus, or Tribeca, or Harare, or Rio de Janeiro, or Paris, or Mumbai, or Baltimore, or Montreal, or Edinburgh. And those things are done to them because they are women. Not women who slipped up in any way, but women who are punished for being women. Now, violence against women in developing countries was exposed in part by Western feminists who used their privilege to add their voices and strength to politicise and to make public the personal and often hidden. And before I get called out for being on some kind of a white saviour ego trip, let me just say this, we should all be saviours. We should all pick up those who are not as strong as us. We should all do this in ways that ultimately enable and support women, all women in all cultures globally. Because if we don't speak up with silent women, we're ultimately personally complicit in the disappearance via malnutrition, murder, infanticide, AIDS, HIV, of women that we'll never know, meet or imagine. For example, our consumerist choices can have negative repercussions for factory workers in, say, Bangladesh. My two pound high street t-shirt costs far more than that in human terms. The first wave feminists, largely white, educated, middle-class women saw their movement gain momentum from and develop alongside the abolitionist movement of the 19th century. 
Now, many waves and generations later, we need to be global feminists who ask awkward questions, who expose the shaky structures that underpin neoliberal globalization, and who demand answers because we have voices and that is the obligation of privilege. Thank you.